think we often get a bit reluctant as modern Western evangelicals to get involved with any intention of evangelism because it's not quite polite. And also beyond that and above that, we don't know quite how it's going to work, how it's going to go, because we live in a world where, um, you know, to, to try and persuade somebody else of your way of thinking, unless of course you're a vegan or a political person or have a certain strong economic view of things, or, or unless you've got anything like that going on, um, you know, it's not acceptable to try and persuade somebody of your opinion, is it? I think what I'm saying is it's not acceptable for Christians in our culture to, to express their view and to persuade people or seek to persuade people to become followers of Christ. It's okay in all sorts of other realms, in all sorts of other spheres and so on. It's good to have an opinion and, you know, that's why you read the sun anyway, isn't it? So you've got an opinion that you can talk about in the restroom, isn't it? So, you don't read the sun, do you? No, I know, I know it was safe. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, so that's, that's the way it goes. We're not allowed. And we get a bit reluctant then, as modern Western evangelicals, to get involved with any intentional evangelism, because we've got some pretty preconceived ideas ourselves about how it should go and how, how things should work out. And our problem, it seems to me, very often with it, is that we fear our expectations of what's going to happen are not going to be met. We fear that what we feel is going to be an acceptable outcome is not what's going to be the outcome. And we become outcome determined rather than glory of God determined in dealing with people and trying to share our faith with people. We feel inhibited from engaging in intentional evangelism because the outcome is something we're concerned about. I, I just recently, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the jolly old Kindle, I bought a book on Kindle, which I had some Christmas money, which is great. Um, but <laughs> on Amazon voucher, super. Um, I bought a book on Kindle, which I seldom do, because normally you can get wonderful cheap Christian books on Kindle. Brilliant. You're doing that, although you're nodding. You've come across this. Yeah, and I came across this book that looked really good. And it's, it's well, it, it's pseudonymous. Pseudon pseudon Somebody's taken a name that's not their name, and they are, um, have a look at it, it's on there, I'll show you later on. They're writing this book under a false name because of what they've been in contact with in terms of Christians in persecution, Christians in suffering places, you know, where to be a Christian is to put your life at risk. And uh, <clears throat> there's a, it's a book called The Insanity of God, uh, A True Story of Faith Resurrected, and it's these missionaries' faith that's being resurrected. As they engage with hardship and difficulty and appalling situations around the world, as they go into those places, and one of the places they've been is Somalia. It's not easy being a Bible-believing Christian in Somalia. Nobody says, thank you very much. That's wonderful. I'm so pleased for you. Nobody says that then. And, and it's how they have really come to a biblical expectation of what will happen when you share your faith with somebody. Rather than the sort of unbiblical expectation that many of the churches in the West have, and we might have ourselves. So the thesis then is basically this. We can be inhibited in actually intentionally sharing our faith with people because we expect the outcome to be X, but biblically the expectation should be Y. And we're afraid we're not going to get X, when we ought to be expecting we're going to get Y, and that's going to be fine. Does that make sense? You can tell me it's not. It's fine. But that's the score. The foreword by David Platt says, um, The completion of the Great Commission will include great suffering, but eternity will prove it is worth the price. And this is what he says the book is about. First, the Great Commission will one day be complete. Great. Secondly, this task of proclaiming Christ to all peoples will include great suffering. Jesus assured of this as well, it's no surprise. Third, eternity, eternity will prove that such suffering was worth the price. The earth is full of sin, sorrow and suffering. And he says, the people writing this book, they know that following Jesus in so many ways actually increases suffering instead of lessening it. But they also know that Jesus is better than all the pleasures, possessions and pursuits of this world put together. And that's the thesis of this book, that's what's going on. Biblically, there's a lot going for it. I'll tell you how I can help. I'll post it on, on the Facebook page. Now, by intentional evangelism, I mean this. I mean deliberately setting about the process of telling people who are without Christ the something, if not the everything, but something, that they need to hear and come to terms with in order to come to Christ and be saved. It's not just information, of course, it's persuading them to do that. 
And that's what I mean by it. Is everybody clear what I mean by it? Deliberately, we're going to tell them this. Because this will help them be safe. Now that involves a theoret not, not a theoretical, but, but a practical, personal awareness of their own sin. Our own sin. And our own resulting inability to earn our own salvation. It will include that fact. It involves not a theoretical understanding of faith, but a practical, ultimate, personal reliance for all our needs on the Christ who saves and secures and then sustains his people. That's faith. Sin, faith. More than that, it involves the practical and personal reorientation of life and lifestyle in a direction that now follows the Christ we've become committed to. The Christ we've become committed to as the absolute visible example of the sort of life God wants us to lead and has a right to tell us to lead because he's the creator. In short, it means that we are overcome by his mercy and grace. We become disciples and followers of Christ himself. It will involve that. But each of us is going to need to reckon with those broad generalizations at a personal level. And at a personal level, the gospel shoe will pinch our foot in a different place. So it may be that we're talking to people about the ethical use of money, honesty, legitimacy in business, fraud. It may come to be that we're talking to people about sexual ethics and the way we live our sex lives in this world. It may be that we need to be speaking with people about indiscipline or anger or a lack of self-control, violence, temper, rage. Because that's where the gospel shoe will pinch on that particular foot. I'm saying the exact subject matter of our conversations in the process of this intentional evangelism is going to vary. Just as the sort of people we encounter and seek to bring to Christ really, really should vary. But biblically the responses we get will fall into certain very similar categories. Jesus spells that out for us, doesn't he, in the parable of the sower and the seed, uh, the sower and the soils. So it's not about the seed at all, it's about the soil, isn't it? And the different responses you ought to expect to get. Some of them are not great. Some of them are disturbing and unsettling. But you don't stop sowing seed. Stupid farmer who stops sowing seed just because he's got some weeds in his field. <laughs> or he gets a hard response. Now, I suppose in practice we tend to expect to reach people like us. We tend to expect to reach them with an inoffensive message, which elicits a completely amiable and polite response and wins us friends the world over, bringing people like us to think the way that we think and do as we do and join our cosy, comfortable Christian club. That really is the presupposition of most of the evangelism training I've ever been on. And I've done so. Biblically, it's up the creek. And the difficulty is that when we don't meet with that expectation, that expectation is not met, we back off and we stop, we withdraw from the whole process and we don't do it anymore. Where, where, <laughs> where would Philip have stood after Peter and John coming down in that reading we read, coming down to Samaria, if his expectations were anything other than completely biblical ones? Oh, Peter came down from Jerusalem and you're an idiot. <laughs> No, you're expecting that because Jesus has already told you the parable of the soils. You're expecting that. And it's great when those guys come down and deal with it. It would have been pretty hard on the, on the Ethiopian eunuch if Philip had had our expectations of what's going to happen with our personal evangelism. Because the Ethiopian eunuch would have never heard we've all been discouraged, withdrawn, sitting in the corner, and we've never gone near the chariot. Okay, well, I think we've exposed that pretty thoroughly. Let's get to the passage we've got in Acts chapter 8.